learn something new today and hopefully everybody else on the <laughs> webinar will learn something new now. All right. Um, well, again, thank you for the invitation. We're going to be talking about recognizing, protecting, and constructing vernal pools. Um, these are habitats that are kind of near and dear to, to my heart. They're just um, fascinating um, ecosystems. Um, I wanted to mention that I am the uh, current president of the Ohio Wetlands Association. Let's see. Um, and uh, I'll put a plug in now for a conference that we are hosting. Uh, we're in the process of getting the final touches put on the event. It's Vernal Palooza, and it's happening March 7th through the 9th um, at Camp Odioqua. And I believe registration is still open. We've got a few spots if anybody really wants to get some hands-on experience, um, hear from some um, you know, pretty accomplished Vernal Pool researchers, et cetera, um, consider joining us for that conference. So I wanted to start with some of the basics of what a vernal pool is. Um, it's a seasonal pool of water that um, provides habitat for distinctive plants and animals. It's an ecosystem services provider, just like all of our wetlands, benefiting us in um, ways that uh, you know many don't recognize because these are functions that are kind of operating in the background, improving water quality, controlling floods, recharging groundwater, et cetera. And they also provide great educational and recreational opportunities. And I would describe these as highly vulnerable wetland ecosystems. And we'll talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> so vernal pools are imperiled resources. Um, we've seen a lot of wetland loss uh, historically around the world, around the United States, um, and particularly in the Midwest. A lot of this has occurred as a result of agricultural conversion. Um, as Denny Poré described, um, it's, uh, he says it's been flat out corn and concrete. Habitat loss um, and that's resulted in the conversion of wetlands has been uh, a major cause of decline in amphibian populations. Um, wetland loss across our lower 48 states um, is estimated at 50%. In Ohio, it's estimated that we've lost more than 90% of our wetlands. And you have to ask yourself how many undocumented losses have and are occurring to sites that look like this following slide for more than half the year. That's a very functional vernal pool in summer. In addition to direct losses from um, conversion, filling activities, we have a lot of sources of degradation that can adversely affect our vernal pool resources. The loss of critical buffers, the vegetated areas around vernal pools are really as important to the uh, species of wildlife that we're trying to sustain as the pools themselves. Um, salamanders in particular, uh, wood frogs, need that forested buffer around where the pools are um, for their existence as adults. And they return to the pools in the spring to, to breed. We also have um, chopped up our, our landscape, um, it created a lot of discontinuity with roads and forest clearing, et cetera, that creates issues for wildlife migration. We've made a lot of changes that affect our hydrology and hydro periods. Uh, our water quality in some areas is declining just due to um, our you know, treatment of the, the road surfaces in winter, other sources of urban runoff, et cetera. <clears throat> so even vernal pools that don't suffer direct impacts may decline in health and function through these other impacts. How do vernal pools differ from other? Wetlands, well, they have a seasonal hydrology. They're sometimes referred to as ephemeral ponds. This intermittent nature of inundation has resulted in a unique co-evolved biota. And I'm gonna talk about some of the different species that occur and, and uh, require vernal pool habitat. 
Plants can be sparse or nearly absent, uh, and this can make delineation uh, a little bit of a challenge because in the process of delineating a wetland, you have to be able to identify that it has wetland vegetation. And oftentimes the pools themselves may be fairly devoid of vegetation or there's only some stunted vegetation growing in the pool. These are more likely to be hydrologically isolated so that they're not regulated by the Army Corps of Engineers, but they are protected by rules in our state and other states. Hey, Mark. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but um, we are seeing a black bar across the top of your screen. And I, I, if you could bear with me, we're gonna try to do something to get rid of it. Sure. I've had this issue before, and I, even though we told you to click that little <laughs> optimize the video button. Yeah. <clears throat> When you shared your screen, did you click two buttons? Yes. Okay. Don't don't click the optimize one. Okay. Click the uh, other one. I think that'll so, still make your audio work, but sometimes sure. that works to get rid of that black bar. Okay. So stop share mm -hmm. and then reshare. And hopefully that will solve the issue. Gotcha. That looks good. Good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so one thing I always like to mention um, when it comes to, to vernal pools, I have a um, pet peeve that um, sometimes people ref will refer to them as temporary uh, wetlands, and they're absolutely not temporary wetlands. They're temporary pools, um, but they're wetlands year round and they're wetlands in the regulatory sense. Um, let's get my advancing going here. Um, so they are permanent wetlands and um, they're as permanent as any ecosystem if we recognize and care for them and they are protected by our laws and regulations. And I would argue that vernal pools absolutely should be protected because they really are magic. Um, like the platform nine and three quarters in Harry Potter, if you know what you're doing, you can truly enter a new world through vernal pool exploration. And I have some third party validation from a very reputable source that these are magic. This is an article by the National Geographic, so I don't think anybody can argue that these are magical systems. So I want to talk a little bit about the fundamentals um, around vernal pools, starting with hydrology. The origins of the hydrology are often geologic processes, um, glaciation and erosion that leave depressional features that are poorly drained on the landscape. We also have anthropogenic disturbance um, sometimes is uh, something as simple as an old logging road where there's been compaction and rutting can cause uh, functional vernal pool habitat to form, and you may find breeding toads and wood frogs um, in the ruts. The size of these systems is widely varied. Um, they can be anywhere from just a, a few dozen square feet up to an acre or more, and the depth um, is also widely varied. Um, in some pools, you may have just a few inches of seasonal inundation. In others, you may get three feet or more of water in the spring. <clears throat> so with non-isolated wetlands, um, these, these wetlands are receiving um, precipitation as all wetlands do. They can also get a lot of runoff um, groundwater introductions via seeps and overbank flooding from streams, but most of our vernal pools are restricted to just um, precipitation and runoff in their immediate vicinity in this closed depression. We will see from time to time some functional vernal pool habitat that's maybe in a stream floodplain, but more commonly they're kind of offset from the, the floodplain in areas that are higher topographically, but um, situated in, in depressions. And so the 
water that comes in um, kind of dictates what the water budget, what the hydro period looks like. This is sometimes referred to as the hydrologic regime. And there's um, some hydrographs showing uh, water level changes over time in some different types of wetland systems. And I want to highlight the, the vernal pool here. The dash line in this image would represent the ground surface and the black line indicates um, standing water. So these are the periods of the year for this particular vernal pool um, where it would have standing water. And you can see that this is in the months of January, February, March, maybe into April. And then it's dry until December when the water starts to build again. So that's just one example of a hydro period. But one commonality with vernal pools is, is that they do tend to dry up at some point during the year. The hydro periods are quite variable. Um, we have what we call short and long cycle pools, um, and uh, some are spring filling, some fill in the fall. So there's a there's a whole spectrum of different types of hydro periods uh, within these wetland systems. But what's important is that there be some confining layer um, represented in this graph as the aquatard. Um, that's just a term for um, a, a zone of imperviousness below the ground. And um, in this graph, the upper dark line represents the soil level. And then we have um, a cumulative precipitation line in green and a cumulative evapotranspiration line in kind of a purplish color. Um, and where we have cumulative um, precipitation exceeding cumulative evapotranspiration, we start to see water build in the pool, and that's where the magic happens. So that blue line extending above the black line is our hydro period for this particular wetland, and it's showing that it's holding water from uh, January, mid-January through uh, probably the end of May. But every pool is unique, and the um, assemblages that we find, the biota that we find using uh, these systems is highly dependent on these hydrologic variables, as well as other factors such as adjacent land use, the habitat surrounding the pools, um, the vegetation community, um, the, the region of the state you're in, et cetera. So I've got some examples of some vernal pool habitat. This is um, a site owned by a friend of ours, David Haig, who has um, started up um, Coyote Run Farms in Pickerington. He's got some really beautiful, intact uh, forested areas on his property with vernal pools. Um, and you can see that level of um, inundation, just shallow pools forming throughout his, his woodlot. And he's in the process of creating more vernal pools in former ag fields and then reforesting those areas. So he's got a very ambitious project going with Coyote Run. Um, Heckert Woods in the uh, Crawford County Park District is probably one of the best um, vernal pools I've ever been able to visit. Um, it's just a really fascinating site. There's uh, an expanse, a pretty large expanse of nice um, vernal pools there. And that's actually the site at which I had my um, title slide uh, photo taken in balancing on a log, trying not to drop my camera. This is a local site that I discovered um, near the Allen Creek Reservoir that is a fascinating little pool. I've seen um, large snapping turtles under the ice at this pool. It's pretty busy with um, spotted salamanders and other things in the, in the spring. And it's a um, site that has um, swamp cottonwoods in it, which is a tree that I don't encounter very often, but they're they're not eastern cottonwoods. They're actually swamp cottonwoods. So that was kind of a neat discovery. And it was a county um, that didn't show um, in the uh, USDA plants database as having um, swamp cottonwoods. So that was a new record for Delaware County. For plants, when we're talking about vernal pools, I mentioned that they can be 
fairly sparsely vegetated. Um, sometimes these can be referred to as black leaf pools. And this does add a level of complexity to a wetland delineation because the vegetation, it, at least uh, as it's perceived, may not coincide with the hydrology aspect of this pool. But it's important when you're looking at uh, a delineation to consider what the adjacent plants are rooting into. And this the water table in an area like this will be very high. So um, the plants that are at the pool edge, even though they're not in the water, um, should be looked at in terms of their indicator status. And chances are very good that you would find that the, the trees in this zone that I've highlighted would be um, hydro, uh, hydrophytes. They would be facultative or um, fact wet or obligate species. So it would um, delineate out as a, as a wetland. So here's some examples of some common um, plants that we see in and around vernal pools. Um, I'm just gonna kind of quickly move through these just to give you a sense of things, but um, any of these could be on your planting palette if you're interested in doing a um, vernal pool restoration yourself and, and planting. Um, these plants might also provide you some um, clues as to where you might have a good area on your property to uh, construct a, a vernal pool. So we have things like pin oaks and swamp white oaks that like their feet wet. A number of different ashes also have a pretty high tolerance for saturation and seasonal flooding. Silver maples and eastern cottonwoods tolerate a substantial amount of flooding um, and oftentimes are associated with our um, bottomland areas where there's um, uh, you know, floodplain habitat. Shellbark hickory and black willow. And um, trees in general will establish themselves um, at the edges of, of deeper pools. Um, in certain contexts, the, the trees may actually be inundated for a period in the spring, um, but in the deepest areas, um, we tend to see a transition to um, shrubs and then herbaceous vegetation. So you kind of get a zonation um, establishing around the hydrologic gradient. So here's some uh, typical shrubs that we will see. Uh, Button bush is probably the most common. This is kind of an iconic vernal pool plant. Um, winterberry, winterberry holly as it's sometimes called, silky dogwood, swamp rose, spice bush is always um, pretty common around vernal pools in mature forested um, deciduous forests. And then we have a lot of different, sometimes showy uh, herbaceous plants. Uh, things like the hemlock, water parsnip, and mad dog skullcap. If there are groundwater seeps, um, you may see skunk cabbage, and this is just the inflorescence of the skunk cabbage, which is starting to pop up now because it's a very early bloomer in our state. The leaves that look like um, giant uh, shard leaves or something um, will, will show up um, later in the spring. They have very big showy leaves. Um, yellow water buttercup, things like the cardinal flower and marsh marigold. The marsh marigold is another one that's closely associated with groundwater and tends to show up in areas where there are seeps. And then we have some really cool ferns. Um, I dug out an area in my um, backyard that was particularly wet um, just to kind of accentuate the hydrology. Um, and uh, I'm growing um, royal fern, um, among other things, even some button bush in this uh, bed that I created in my yard. And then we have <clears throat> lots and lots of sedges um, in the Carex genus, hop sedge, gray sedge, the brome-like sedge, the very showy fringe sedge. And then finally, um, 
in certain pools, you may have um, free floating plants like duckweed and water meal. Those typically occur in more high nutrient situations, uh, but they're part of the part of the ecosystem. So from a vernal pool perspective, um, we all know that plants are important and um, they're important for um, storing carbon and air quality, uh, producing oxygen. Um, they, they provide cover for a lot of wildlife. The plants are also um, key to the life cycle of a lot of the species that utilize um, vernal pools. Things like um, dragonflies and damselflies will deposit eggs in um, living plants or sometimes directly on the water. Uh, species like um, the swamp darner that you see at the left will deposit eggs on um, dead plant material. Um, and there's a, a green darner also doing that on a floating dead stem. The um, stems are also um, a substrate for deposition of eggs by our native salamanders. So they, they find those um, underwater branches to adhere their eggs to kind of keep them up off the pool floor, providing some protection from would-be predators. So let's talk about the uh, species that reside in these pools. And I want to give a shout out to a former employee, Aaron Labor, who um, took a lot of this um, video that you'll see. There's some underwater video. He was into diving and underwater photography, and I had him uh, get some really nice um, imagery for us when he worked for us. So in terms of the um, wildlife that um, will use these pools. We have a lot of different invertebrates, things like micro crustaceans that you can uh, see with the naked eye, but um, probably only identify under magnification. You'll just see little specks um, swimming around in these pools. We have fairy shrimp, and I'll be talking about fairy shrimp in a little more detail. Things like water mites, those little red um, spiders, fingernail clams, snails, midges, um, which are uh, larval um, flies, look like little, little worms, diving beetles, caddisflies, mayflies, crayfish, such as the digger crayfish, which is kind of a typical crayfish for vernal pools, and more. People get a little more excited about some of the more charismatic um, mesofauna, let's call it that, um, the mole salamanders, um, which are a, a general classification of salamanders that have a um, subterranean uh, existence. They tunnel in the soil, in the rich forest soil around the pools, and then come to the pools in the spring uh, to deposit eggs and start the next generation. Um, so things like the tiger and smallmouth salamanders, Numerous species of frogs and toads are reliant on vernal pools. There are a lot of snakes and turtles that will visit vernal pools. Wading birds, waterfowl, and other birds um, such as kingfishers and swamp sparrows may venture into these habitats, but they're most important to the amphibians. This is uh, Jenna, our aquatic biologist, um, doing some sampling. I believe this was maybe taken at Coyote Run Farms, but I can't recall. Um, here she's holding a um, passive sampling system called a funnel trap. And we'll often sample vernal pools using funnel traps. They just get set in the water, usually with a stake that they're tied off to. We try to keep one end of the funnel trap um, up out of the water so that if adult frogs um, should swim into the trap, they can um, still get up for air because if the trap is fully submersed, um, they can't get up for air and, and frogs and toads can perish in these things. So you wanna be careful in how they're set, but <clears throat> these are um, passive systems. They're just in the water. 
the organisms are swimming through the pool. Um, they are just exploring their environment. And when they swim up the throat of the funnel and drop into the interior of that mesh bag, um, they get kind of disoriented and can't figure out how to get back up to the um, opening. At least most of them don't. And you'll set them out for 24 hours, go back the next day. And if you're lucky, you'll have uh, some critters to, to look at and then release. Um, this is a nifty little um, viewer um, that's got some developing salamander eggs. Um, there's a fairy shrimp in there, and I think uh, maybe chorus frog eggs, some frog eggs in there, I think. Um, so that's how we go about sampling. So let's take a look at some of these um, kind of fascinating vernal pool obligate um, species. The first is the, the fairy shrimp. And this is the basic life cycle of the, the fairy shrimp um, going from the adult form, um, reproducing and, and uh, uh, depositing these, these dormant um, cysts that will overwinter, um, awaiting the next um, fill in the pool. Um, when the pool fills, the um, cysts will hatch um, and the, these animals metamorphose very quickly into the adult form in just a matter of, of weeks um, so that they can um, deposit that next generation of, of dormant cysts in the bottom of the pool. So full disclosure, um, this is actually the um, brine shrimp life cycle, what uh, the um, commercial sales folks refer to as the sea monkey, um, but it's it's very, very uh, similar to our native fairy shrimp, which I'm gonna trademark as the puddle monkey and start selling, not seriously, but. So here's a video of uh, one of these puddle monkeys, uh, fairy shrimp, couple of fairy shrimp swimming around in the pool. That one I believe has um, an egg mass that it's, dragging along. So those will be the, the cysts that reside in the sediment until the next pool is filled. So kind of cool to see that underwater view. And there is no sound with this video, so. Here's another one. And here, in addition to the fairy shrimp, you can see a lot of these micro crustaceans. The, the water is literally teeming with life. You could see all the little micro crustaceans moving around. So for other invertebrates, I wanted to just quickly give you a, a rundown of some of the things we commonly see. What we might refer to as denizens of the shallow. Um, these are uh, scuds. This is a um, amphipod, and they they look kind of shrimp like when they're when they're swimming about in the pool. This is a caddisfly, and caddisflies um, are um, terrestrial as adults, but they um, develop in the water and they build protective cases um, to kind of uh, act as camouflage and protection in the vernal pool. Then we have things like the uh, Eastern toe biter, sometimes referred to as the giant water bug. And these are predators, ambush predators, as you can tell from those raptorial legs. In the background, the insect that was floating upward was a back swimmer. Another common pool resident. <clears throat> this is a the larva of a predaceous diving beetle. So the, that will grow up to be a very sleek, oh, and there's a mosquito larva in that, in that frame. Um, the predaceous diving beetle larva will grow up to be a fairly robust, sleek um, 
beetle that is a predator in the pools. But what we tend to get most excited about uh, when it comes to vernal pools is the salamander run. Um, that's, I think, one of the, the magical um, experiences that you can have when it comes to vernal pools is to get out uh, at the right time in the spring when you get that first warm rain and get to see uh, perhaps hundreds of salamanders moving to the pool. So here's a run by salamander standards, just so you understand what we're talking about. It's not exactly a run, but they're moving. They're on the move. They're all heading to the pools um, in mass. Um, oftentimes it's uh, you know, triggered by that first warm rain and all the salamanders in the area start moving out of the um, soil and heading to the pool. This was a photograph taken at David Hegg's Coyote Run Farms, and all of the salamanders you see in that picture came out of one uh, funnel trap. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about a run. I had to throw this in just because I thought it was too funny. So if you're not aware, the spotted salamander <clears throat> is Ohio's state amphibian. Um, let's see that one, that video didn't play. Let me see if this one will. Oh shoot, all of a sudden my videos aren't playing. I'm gonna try to uh, unshare and pick up on this slide and see if it'll correct itself. Sometimes that works. Yeah. I hate to not have those run because they're, they're yeah, cool. I think, I think we all want to see them. <laughs> Let's see here. I hope it doesn't give up the ghost. It all ran this morning. Ah, it doesn't want to do it. Play media. Oh no. Well, what you, oh, man, I don't know. I um, I can try to close the program real quick and then reopen it. Okay. Because your other ones, were the other videos that kind of the same that you've been playing? Or are they yeah, different? yeah, yep. Huh, weird. Um, let me. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. It's a problem. You can do all these really cool, sophisticated things with uh, programs, but then you can also overwhelm your, your system. Um, Let's hope that this will fingers work. crossed. <laughs> All right, there is a salamander slide. Okay. It looks better. Well, is, it, is it doing something? No, well, it looks like it's playing. Oh, there yes. we go. Yes. There we go. All right. <laughs> Woo. Woo <laughs> Way to troubleshoot. Yeah. So um, these were some spotted salamanders that were uh, just entering uh, the shallow edge of a pool that we like to visit in the spring that's near Allen Creek Reservoir. The, uh, the dam for the reservoir actually bisects what might have been at one time a larger vernal pool. Um, it's, it's where the, the grade of the levee is kind of uh, meeting the existing grade around the reservoir. But there's still um, on either side of that 
levee, um, there's uh, some nice vernal pools. This is another one that, there we go. A little closer view of one crawling over a mossy log. So that's our state salamander. They're fascinating, fascinating creatures. And we have some um, video here of the um, egg development. Over time, Aaron um, visited the pool on multiple occasions and just shot a few seconds of video. Um, you can see some of the water mites. There's a, an adult salamander in the background there. This is during the developmental process. Predaceous diving beetle just landed on the egg mass. Here, there's um, some algae that's starting to grow and the, the um, mucousy surroundings of the um, egg mass is, is getting more cloudy looking. Gradually, that material breaks down as the larvae are maturing. And then they'll eventually hatch out of that egg mass. And they'll spend some time in the pool as larvae and then exit the pool uh, and find a hiding spot nearby. Um, we got a permit from the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves to do some sampling at the Gahanna Woods State Nature Preserve. And um, it's got some really spectacular vernal pools. And we found this young sub-adult um, spotted salamander, um, fairly small, um, under under a log, hiding right next to the next to the pool, which is kind of cool to see. Here's some um, smallmouth salamander video. This is one of our more tolerant species. Um, it can it can handle some uh, poorer water quality, um, maybe less uh, or more degraded habitat. I would say. Uh, it's not as sensitive as some of our other species, but um, still a, a, a good species to have around. It's fairly common. Here's a Jefferson salamander. And then one of our, our favorite salamanders to see is the uh, tiger salamander. And the Calamus Swamp Preserve, um, which is managed by Columbus Audubon um, down um, south of Columbus is a great place to see these uh, tigers. We've gone on a couple of occasions to explore the vernal pools there. And um, here are some of the tiger salamanders that we found. And these are the largest uh, mole salamanders that we have in the state. Um, they're uh, voracious predators with big mouths. They eat a lot of things in the, in the pools. One of the fun and interesting stories with our um, trips down to Calamus Swamp is that we found um, an animal in uh, 2020 that had this unusual dark um, spot on its just behind its head. And in 2021, we were out sampling again and noticed that we had an animal with a dark spot and we pulled up our images from the preceding year and we are pretty confident based on the spot pattern that we caught the same animal twice at that pool, which is kind of interesting. And here's my, my glam shot of a tiger salamander from a site that we were um, actually doing an amphibian relocation because the, the woods had to be cleared and we moved those to other um, acceptable habitats nearby. The other thing that makes vernal pools a lot of fun is the cacophony of calling um, frogs in the spring, frogs and toads. So I've got some examples here. Um, these sites can be really busy and um, oftentimes deafening with the sound of, of uh, um, these different frogs. So we have things like the wood frog. Um, this uh, the photo on the right was taken at the, the pool at Allen Creek um, Park 
Um, and I found it interesting that the wood frogs chose to uh, lay their um, voluminous egg masses on um, some briars there. There's, um, uh, I think, a rubus species that that uh, was, was growing in the water, and they found that to be an acceptable spot to put their eggs. And then here's uh, some underwater video of a couple of wood frogs that are kind of nestled down in a patch of salamander eggs, and uh, they're in amplexus, so the male is holding on to the female, but they're they're in amongst another species eggs as they're sitting there. That was also at that Allen Creek pool. American toads are pretty common uh, around vernal pools. Um, they're one of the species that isn't considered a vernal pool obligate. These can breed in a lot of different types of um, marshy pond habitats, um, sometimes really shallow sluggish streams, but um, they're, a, they're a really neat species to see. And this, works. this is what a trailing toad sounds like. If you've ever been near a vernal pool in the early spring, you'll probably recognize this next call. Um, this is a tiny frog, uh, the spring peeper, about an inch long. And when you've got a good spring peeper population, uh, this one in particular can, can just make a deafening cacophony of sound. And it's almost disorienting. You go into the pool and you're trying to actually see a frog and they're calling all around you and it's next to impossible to spot them. It's pretty amazing. They find discrete hiding places and call. This one happened to be out in the open. This one is being uh, silent, probably because it suspects uh, uh, that there's danger at hand with this big bullfrog looking at it. I think I would be quiet in that context. And there was a little spring peeper swimming under the water. Here's my favorite photograph of a spring peeper to date. Um, this was at a site in preservation parks. It was actually a mitigation wetland, but um, just the most beautifully patterned um, spring peeper hanging out on a button bush there. This next frog is probably my, my favorite frog um, in and around vernal pools. And again, it's not a vernal pool obligate, um, but you certainly find them uh, in these settings. This is the gray tree frog. Um, I actually found this one on the hottest of summer days, um, looking at a mitigation site for the city of Columbus. It was August and it was like 98 degrees out. And I saw this gray tree frog just sitting um, kind of over the water, but hanging out on a, a willow branch. And it was very patient as I took close range photos of it. Um, the gray tree frog is fascinating. Uh, it is kind of chameleon-like, and it can transition its skin color from um, green, if it's sitting on green vegetation, to more of a gray or brown as they're sitting on bark. And this was an assortment of gray tree frogs we found at our wetland project at Highlands Park in Westerville. And we just brought them back to the office for a short duration to take some uh, photographs to show the variability in their appearance. And <clears throat> at Highlands Park, um, we've discovered that one of the favorite um, haunts of the gray tree frogs is to sit in the um, prairie buffer that we planted around the wetland that has cut plants. And if you know this plant, it has um, leaves that are joined at the stem and they'll actually hold uh, a little pool of water. And the frogs just love to sit in those pools and fall in the spring.
So that's what we're fighting to protect, I think, is um, that that uh, diversity that we see in and around these wetlands. And I would argue that vernal pools are very definitely ecological gems worthy of protection. So how can we how can we find them? How can we identify them? Well, aerial photographs can be useful. Um, National wetland inventory maps looking at um, wetlands that are mapped within uh, forested settings, those oftentimes uh, will have some vernal pool function. Um, you can use your ears, spring surveys, just going driving through your community or walking your property in the early spring to see if you hear um, frogs calling is a good way to locate um, where the pools may be. Um, if you encounter a depressional area in which vegetation is sparse or absent, you might um, make note of it and go back in the late winter, early spring and see if it's actually holding water. And then uh, uh, resources like iNaturalist can give you some idea of um, species locations. And if you're seeing somebody's records for spotted salamanders or wood frogs, you know that there's a vernal pool in the area of that record. So here's an aerial photograph, um, and you can see the, the wood lot with some kind of dark signature areas uh, and maybe some flow paths in between. And this is pretty typical of vernal pools. There may be some little, you know, ephemeral type drainage features uh, from one pool to the next. But when you turn on the National Wetland Inventory layer, you can see that those have already been mapped um, as wetlands, as a forested wetland. So this is the National Wetland Inventory map. So how can um, we save the, the magic of vernal pools for future generations? I think one of the first things is to, to know your land. Um, if, if you're um, a landowner and you have that privilege and you're interested in um, preserving our environment and uh, wildlife populations, uh, really getting a sense of the chunk of ground that you're responsible for is beneficial. And if you can do things um, for um, enhancing the, the pools or uh, practicing sound planning around um, the, the pools that you have, that's a great benefit. And it's important to remember that if we're protecting vernal pools, we need to protect those buffers. We can't take too much forest around a vernal pool and expect the vernal pool to continue to function optimally. Um, public education is big. Um, that's something that the Ohio Wetlands Association focuses on a lot, just getting the word out. I mentioned our Vernal Palooza um, Science Conference coming up. Strong laws and ordinances, um, park and preserve establishment, um, land trusts, etc., and incentives for landowners can all go a long way. And citizen science factors right in there. The more people know about these resources, the more they appreciate them, the more data we have, um, the better we can do at protecting vernal pools. So with that overview, I want to transition and talk about um, vernal pool um, construction and uh, start starting with site selection, just to give you some ideas of um, what's possible in terms of uh, creating or uh, restoring vernal pools. So for site selection, it's all about location, location, location. We like to use um, Google Earth aerials if we're just kind of scouting um, potential areas where vernal pool creation would be possible. Um, Google Earth can provide a lot of useful information with um, current aerial images, historic images. Um, if you're not familiar with that, there's a, a little button at the top of the Google Earth um, page that looks like a, a clock. And when you click on that, it'll tell you, it'll show you the years in which imagery is available. And it can be really helpful to toggle through those different years because um, oftentimes the photos are taken at different time periods, you may find the perfect capture where the leaves are off the trees and you can see the forest floor and you can kind of see these wet areas. Um, so it's it's really beneficial. 
Um, in farm settings, um, we'll often see where the tiles run if you if the capture is at the right time of the year. There's no crop on the field, and you can see where the drainage tiles are underneath the soil. So oftentimes with the work that we're doing with restoration, we're trying to find those tiles and, and disrupt them so that they no longer uh, take water off the land and we can allow the water to build again in, in wetland areas. Um, and there are many uh, add-on layers that are available within Google Earth. So you can look at uh, the soils that are mapped for an area. You can look at the National Wetland Inventory map. Um, the topography and other other types of reports, like there's a US EPA resource called My Waters that has information on the watershed and streams. So here's the web soil survey. Um, the yellow lines indicate the mapped um, soil series on this property. And when you click on um, a particular polygon, it will bring up information on the soil type. Um, so we've got a couple different soil types here. And when you click on that, um, it'll bring up information on the soil taxonomy. And you can actually see information like the drainage class. So these soils are very poorly drained. Um, this field had a lot of tile in it because the soils don't naturally drain well. But that can be useful for uh, planning purposes. You want to look for areas where water would naturally collect um, as you're evaluating your own potential projects or properties. Um, and you may actually see evidence of, of some level of, of you know, periodic saturation um, that, that would give you an idea that this might be a good, a good area to um, create a, a little deeper depression to create a hydro period that would allow for vernal pool. Um, biota to establish. Flat areas are generally um, easier and less expensive for pool development, but you can do work on hillsides where you create an embankment to catch water coming down a slope. We tend to look for um, artificially drained hydric soils, um, soils that are listed as poorly drained uh, but don't have uh, National Wetland Inventory wetlands um, that are indicated. Um, those might provide some opportunity for vernal pool creation and then any other areas of poor drainage. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you have wet areas of your property, you need to be cautious that um, you may be uh, in a situation where you already have a wetland. So it's a good idea to do a wetland delineation before you make any big plans because you might actually need some permits to get in there and, and modify that. The soils um, that are ideally suited are um, hydric soils, and if they're artificially drained, they maintain some of their hydric characteristics. They just need to be rehydrated by removing the tile that artificially dewaters the, the soil. Um, but soils that are frequently inundated um, undergo uh, physical and chemical changes that result in color shifts uh, because of the chemical oxidation and reduction of, of um, the, the soil. And this is a good um, overview of, of, or a good image of what a hydric soil might look like. This was all from the same um, uh, soil profile um, with the darkest material being at the top of the soil profile and the most light gray at the bottom of the, the probe. When you're on a property, particularly outside of the, the wetter period of the year, um, there's still lots of indicators you can see on your landscape that an area may be a vernal pool or would have the potential for vernal pool creation. Um, this includes things like the blackened um, water stained leaves and uh, water marks on the trees. This is a little hard to see, but every tree has kind of a dark um, stain at a certain level. When you see all that staining on a, a plane, uh, on the same plane, that gives you an indication of how high the water has been, and um, you'll you'll know that you have a, a vernal pool. Things like sediment deposits um, on leaves, uh, drift lines where floatable material kind of builds in one area at the edge of the water, um, you may see that. 
Um, aerial imagery can be helpful for identifying um, areas of inundation. And then these sparsely vegetated concave surfaces and soil cracks in clay soils are also indicators of hydrology that should give you some idea of the potential of a vernal pool to exist or uh, be created on a particular piece of ground. So generally, we're looking for silt loams, um, silty clay loams. Um, we tend to check soil permeability using uh, what's called a double ring infiltrometer. And we're looking for permeability rates that are less than um, 0.2 inches per hour, typically will work. Um, if you're running heavy equipment, oftentimes the compaction can kind of help um, to uh, reduce water losses. But you want to be cautious with compaction because the upper layer of soil ideally um, should be loose enough that um, things can burrow into it, plants can root into it, etc. So we try not to compact the surface too much. Um, we tend to target soils that are somewhat poorly to very poorly drained. In general, in our state, liners are not recommended. I would say if you have a, a site that uh, would require a synthetic liner. You probably haven't done a great job of site selection and you should keep looking because we have plenty of uh, soil that will hold water. As I mentioned, it's important to avoid existing wetlands. Um, you want to be considerate of your neighbors. Vernal pools can produce some um, mosquitoes and if your flood footprint maybe extends onto an adjacent property, they, that may not be appreciated. But there are ways to work with this and, and come up with a good, a good plan that's neighbor friendly. Um, avoid areas that are accessible to livestock. And ideally pick a location that has some intact um, uh, adjacent habitat. Um, you want these natural habitats and buffers to be available. As you're um, looking at sites, you want to um, consider any factors that will um, influence your hydrologic regime, the frequency and duration of flooding, including the sunlight exposure, soil permeability, annual, annual precipitation and evapotranspiration, um, water depth, et cetera. And think about where your water is coming from, what's the watershed, and where will you release excess water? Um, because you may want to direct that overflow in kind of a controlled fashion. So here's some basics um, on uh, vernal pool design and, and wetland restoration in general. Um, when it comes to um, wetland creation, we have essentially three major tools in the toolbox. These are tile disruption, either um, intercepting or blockading um, tile so that it doesn't take water uh, away from the land. Um, we have excavation, creating depressional areas that will hold water. And then embankment, um, creating high spots that will help to uh, increase the footprint of, of flooding. And Every project is a little bit different, but most projects involve um, one or more of these techniques to get, um, get water building uh, within a, a pool area. When you're thinking about sizing, um, vernal pools that um, have uh, uh, they, they can exist in gaps in a uh, forested area that are as small as 15 by 15 feet. So um, you don't need a large area to accomplish a vernal pool. And if you can work in and around trees, you can make some very nice um, site appropriate vernal pools and protect your, your forest cover. Um, because vernal pools are small, they don't require a large watershed. Um, they don't have a large storage volume, and the um, typical sizes range from several hundred square feet to three or more acres. Um, 
with smaller pools, um, when you're doing a, a grading plan, you can do something that is a very simple shape, um, kind of a roundish or oval shape. And that would be very appropriate for a small, um, a smaller pool. If you have a larger expanse in which you want to create a, a vernal pool, you want to have a more natural looking undulating edge. Um, it's beneficial to have some complexity in that setting. Um, and it looks more natural. Um, you want to kind of fit it into the uh, landscape and have it um, look as though it, uh, it belongs. Um, in the largest vernal pool areas, um, and I consider a large vernal pool to be a quarter acre and up, you might consider adding hummocks or islands. And I'm going to show you some images of that. It's also helpful to create fairly gentle slopes um, leading into the pool. You get a nice um, zonation for the establishment of um, vegetation along that hydrologic gradient. And then you want to have some sort of a plan for where water goes when it overflows. And I'll, I'll use the term spillway, um, but Mark, are you there? I think we lost you. Very consequential. Uh, this is very consequential to the overall habitat quality um, is having um, Microtopography in the form of hummocks, which are landforms. You can see some natural hummocks. This is a hummock that we created on a construction project. You can see this is uh, before anything was even planted on the site. We had left a kind of an island of soil um, in the middle of that um, wetland. But hummocks are great for enhancing biological diversity. They give areas for the biota to crawl out of the water um, and uh, uh, they're just generally valuable in terms of the overall ecosystem function. And then the other uh, major type of microtopography are tussocks. And some of our vegetation is uh, known for creating these vegetated clumps that are um, scattered around through a pool. Um, oftentimes, if you, if you get to one of these pools in the spring and you're trying to keep your, your feet dry, you can hop from from tussock to tussock, because the root mass is strong enough, you can kind of hop on these little vegetated islands. And those also offer a lot of hiding places and structure for the biota of vernal pools. So I have a um, image here of one of the projects that we did for the Nature Conservancy, which had a lot of vernal pool habitat created. There's a short, whoops. Let's see, I don't know if this is going to work. My video stopped working again. Um, there was just a little bit of a flyover, but in this uh, image, you can see that we'd gotten a recent snow after construction was completed, and the hummocks that we created stand out very plainly because they're snow capped and surrounded by water. So that was part of the establishment of, of quality vernal pool habitat on that Cuyahoga Headwaters project. So let's talk a little bit about construction. I first want to mention a uh, great resource for anyone interested in creating a vernal pool. Um, Thomas Biebighauser wrote this guide called A Guide to Creating Vernal Ponds, and it is a very digestible treatise of um, how to go about creating vernal ponds. And it's very practical, pragmatic information on site selection, construction, um, planting, et cetera. And it's a free resource. So at the end of this slide set, um, I've got a link that you can download the PDF of this guide. And I would highly recommend it if you want 
uh, to take a little bit more time to understand um, how to uh, do this work. He even has a section on budgeting if you're going to do your own little project. But a few things to think about when you're planning construction is, you know, if you need heavy equipment, how are you going to get it in and out of a um, site? Um, and I, I say if it's needed because we actually did a, a vernal pool construction for the Wilderness Center um, that was organized through the um, Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist Program, where a, a group of the certified volunteer naturalists simply worked with me to select a site and then they went back uh, the following um, weekend and hand excavated just using shovels excavated a pool and um, later that spring I got an excited email from the wilderness center um, naturalist saying that they already had wood frogs breeding in their new new pool so you can do you can create a functional vernal pool by hand um, if you've got you know some some friends that want to help you dig it out. Um, if you are bringing in equipment, figure out how you can get back into a site with a minimal disruption of the forest community. Look for those natural breaks in the canopy. Um, develop a grading plan that will kind of fit the um, landscape and the and the um, positioning of the trees. And think about the soil balance. Um, this is something that is part and parcel to everything we do in wetland design. And that is figuring out how we can manage soil um, so that we don't have an excess of spoils or a, a shortage of material to construct a project. So it typically comes down to trying to balance the what we call the cut and fill on the site so that we don't have to pay money um, and, and run up costs by hauling material in or out of the site. Um, and you can get creative with that. Like I mentioned the hummocks, if you've got some extra soil and you wanna make a little island in the center of your pool, that's a good way to place some of that soil. Um, you wanna mark locations of trees, structures, and utilities that should be avoided and also evaluate um, propagule sources, what, what plant communities are in the area um, and what species are likely to show up um, kind of on their own, um, especially if you have uh, a lot of um, non-native invasive species in the area, you're going to want to factor in some management to keep the invasives from overrunning your, your project area. So for construction um, site preparation, we tend to go in and remove invasive species, um, clean up any trash or dump sites, um, mark the construction route and areas for soil placement, um, and then mark out the, the pools and anywhere that you want to have um, spoils placed. Whoops. So here's some site preparation work that we did for a project here in Westerville. Um, we actually worked with a local watershed group, Friends of Alum Creek and Tributaries, um, to remove honeysuckle. And then we came in with um, light construction equipment and created vernal pools in the area that we had opened up. And I'll mention that when you see um, Amer honeysuckle, kind of our common honeysuckle, um, it cannot really tolerate a lot of wetness. So if you've got an area that is um, low ground and growing uh, this honeysuckle, it's it's a great candidate for vernal pool creation because you can get the hydrology um, and you know it's not currently a wetland if it's dominated by that particular honeysuckle because it just can't tolerate a high level of wetness. But once you have the um, excavation completed, um, your pool will fill very nicely and uh, you'll have less invasives on your property. With uh, construction in terms of soil handling, we tend to recommend that you strip and um, stockpile your topsoil. That's a valuable resource and you don't want to bury it. So we'll usually have it set aside. Um, we'll have the contractor excavate shallow one to two foot depressions, um, but over excavate. So they might be digging to two or three feet 
um, to allow for respread of topsoil so that you have a nice um, topsoil layer for vegetation growth and um, tunneling animals, et cetera. If you're constructing a berm, it's a good idea to dig, fill, and compact a core trench, um, building the berm up in layers on top because that can help to reduce um, soil losses um, underneath an uh, area that would otherwise just be mounded. Um, the, the berm at the surface provides a certain amount of function in terms of holding back water, but you can lose a lot of water, water under the berm if you don't have kind of a compacted um, core that's, um, that the berm sits on. So it's a good idea to dig down like three or four feet and then backfill with clay that's compacted in layers. You then want to bring um, bring in your um, topsoil and make sure that that is fairly um, non-compacted. Sometimes you'll go through a little decompaction step to just till it, um, keep it nice and loose, and then let uh, let things fill. But it's fine that the subsurface layers are fairly compact because that's forming that aquitard that I mentioned earlier. If you happen to be hand digging a small pool, that process can be simplified oftentimes you'll just dig the pool to the depth you want. You're oftentimes only digging into the topsoil anyway. It's going to be a shallow feature and uh, it'll perform just fine as a vernal pool if everything else um, checks the boxes for soil permeability, et cetera. So here's some examples of the light equipment that were brought in for the vernal pool creation in Westerville. Um, if you have competent operators, they can work amongst the trees and, and leave a lot of trees up while still accomplishing the excavation work. Um, and, and the end result is great because you've got mature trees right up to the pool edge. When that work is done, you want to look at um, revegetating the area. So we typically do this through seeding and planting. Um, there is a variety of um, nurseries and seed providers that have some good forested wetland or vernal pool seed mixes. Um, you can plant um, rooted material, container plants of ferns, um, sedges and rushes, shrubs and trees, um, such as the ones that were in the list of plants that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's uh, recommended that you look at local reference sites, find a a nearby nature preserve um, that has some vernal pools and look at the vegetation that grows there naturally. That'll give you a good indication of what would do well in your pool and what's regionally appropriate. Um, another option for revegetation is to use another pool as a donor site. Um, with some of our woody species, you can take live cuttings um, and you can even dig up some plants. You'd want to uh, be cautious about how much you remove from another wetland. Um, but if it's your property and, and you have the ability to move some things around, um, you could certainly um, take some plants from another wetland area to get that population established in your vernal pool. So here's a um, follow-up seeding and planting at the, the project I've been mentioning in Westerville. Um, seeding and uh, planting of rooted plant material. We kind of like putting at least a certain amount of plugs, as we call them, into these wetland projects because they do provide um, kind of a jump start to the plant community. There's already something there on the ground um, in terms of public perception. It looks like there's something going on in terms of wildlife use. There's already some um, plant material um, stems that they can lay eggs in, um, et cetera. And uh, so it's helpful to have that that mix because there's a there's a time lag when you're doing seeding and you might not see much of a plant community for two or three years from a seed mix. And then the final step I want to mention on the construction side is accessorizing. Um, this is fun. You get to exercise some some creative uh, license by adding um, structure in the pools. You can move logs, rocks, leaf litter. Um, you can create uh, little hummocks of uh, soil and add specimen plants. Um, don't let anyone ever convince you that tires are a vernal pool accessory. Get those out of there. 
but this woody debris is is really one of the most important aspects. Um, vernal pools and wet woods in general um, tend to have a lot of wind thrown trees. So trees are getting toppled. They're fairly shallowly rooted in areas where the water table is high um, and uh, the wind can knock them over. And it may look a little bit messy, but it's actually ideal for um, vernal pool habitat. The critters um, take advantage of those resources. So we'll see if this last video plays, but I thought you might be interested to see a time lapse. Um, this was a vernal pool project we did with the wilds, and you can kind of see the, the whole process. And I'm going to let that play, and then I just want to mention a few um, resources that you all might be interested in after the video plays. If it will play. Not my day for videos. I see the same message as last time. It says cannot play media, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so what you would what you would see in that video just drives me nuts when things operate on on the run through here and then we we launch it for a webinar and it doesn't work. But um, we had the heavy equipment kind of scurrying around, um, shaping a little bit of a berm and depression there at the wilds. Um, and then we, uh, you know, place some some coarse woody debris and put some uh, cover crop on the, the berm, put some straw down just to kind of start to establish some vegetation around the edge of the pool. And it's kind of a cool little video just to understand the, the process. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like it wants to play. Um, after that work was completed, um, this was the, the first fill. I haven't gotten any recent um, updates on this site, um, but we know it was um, working as far as the hydrology, and it was just a question of what um, vernal pool uh, inhabitants might uh, find their way into that, that pool eventually. My apologies that the video didn't work. Um, my last few slides here are um, resources that could be useful um, to, the, to the group. Um, this is a listing of some of the Google Earth layers and a little tutorial on how to access um, Google Earth historical imagery. Um, I imagine I, I could provide this slide set um, or at least these lists to anybody that wants them. And um, Marnie and Kathy, you'll have to let me know how you'd go about that distribution. Um, but those are some useful links. And basically with the Google Earth layers, you just have to download the file and it will immediately launch into Google Earth. So you have that layer available. You just have to turn it on so that it'll show as you're reviewing mapping. And then um, I wanted to mention some books and, and guides that um, can be useful. I've already mentioned Tom Biebighauser's Guide to Creating Vernal Ponds. That's a free um, PDF that you can get online and the link is provided provided there. If you just search the title, the first link that comes up on Google is the link that will allow you to download it. Um, Tom also wrote a very influential book, um, useful book on wetland drainage restoration and repair that I learned a lot from in terms of wetland restoration. And then um, there's a couple of good titles um, by Calhoun and Coburn um, specifically on vernal pools. Um, those are pretty um, detailed uh, scientific type publications, but if you're really into vernal pools, those are great, great resources. Finally, I wanted to mention the Ohio Vernal Pool Network. Um, technically, it's the vernal pool network that is hosting Vernal Palooza coming up. It's kind of a uh, collaboration between Ohio Wetlands Association and the Midwest Biodiversity Institute. Um, and we have um, some, some different uh, programs that are organized through the Vernal Pool Network. And finally, um, the Ohio Wetlands Association has 
copies of this book called Ohio's Hidden Wonders, which um, is just a plethora of information on vernal pools and the species that inhabit them. Um, and we sell these through the Wetlands Association for $30. So it's a nice little um, Ohio specific guide for vernal pools. So with that, I will ask if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Mark. That was fabulous. Great pictures, loved all the videos and no worries about them not working. We all, we've all <laughs> been there. <laughs> you practice as much as you want and yeah. technology doesn't cooperate. Um, I'm just glad that so many of those videos played because you had a lot of great ones. So um, I did put the chat for the guide to creating vernal ponds in, uh, or the link, excuse me, in the chat. Um, but Mark, if you maybe can just send us an email with those links that you provided at the end, um, mm -hmm. I can make sure that everybody has those available. We can um, we can even include a little document with the links um, on our website when we post uh, the recording, sure. if that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. And we do have lots of questions, and they're they're coming in quick. And I, I noticed there were some in the chat. So if you are one of the folks that had a question in the chat, if you could, please put it in the question and answer um, box if uh, you haven't already. So I'm just going to start at the top. Um, Allison asks, what are the pros and cons of creating a home vernal pool? A home vernal pool. Vernal pool. Um, I think that... Um, I would be curious to know a little bit more about the property um, when when we use a term like home vernal pool. Um, you might not want a vernal pool like right next to your house, but if you have a property that's um, a little bit larger and you've got one corner that is you know maybe forested, um, the you know the advantages that I, I see for the property owner is you know just the opportunity to observe nature cycles firsthand and and be connected to nature in that way and know that you're you're helping to be part of the solution um uh, by creating that feature um you can you know you can use um depressional areas as you know a way to manage water on your property um you know it can help to to control flooding and wetness elsewhere um and you know, I think that probably the most common um, complaint would be that, you know, the the pools can generate a certain amount of mosquito life. But what we tend to see is that the a, a truly healthy vernal pool has um, such a diverse community of predators that um, the mosquitoes don't tend to be problematic. Um, they're there, you know, just just like you know, any place in Ohio in the summer, you'll find some mosquitoes. But um, if if you've got that healthy functioning um, vernal pool that has a hydro period that's on the order of months and not days or weeks, um, you won't see a lot of issues um, with with uh, nuisance mosquitoes. Where you get into problems is where you have um, just a shallow um, amount of water um, and pools that are only persisting for two weeks at a time. And that's just the perfect um, mosquito breeding habitat because there's nothing there that that eats mosquitoes and, and uh, cuts down on the mosquito problem. So creating a, a functional vernal pool actually can help to uh, probably reduce the amount of mosquitoes if you've already got an area that's marginally wet, but just not wet enough to support predators, make it wetter. That's awesome. Then you kind of went into come, some of the next questions that I had about uh, mosquitoes and and some control measures. Um, so I'll just tag on to that real quickly. There's a question about using mosquito dunks in temporary yeah. pools and, you know, what impacts those might have on other critters. It's always been my understanding that, um, you know, that the, the dunks are um, fairly benign in regards to impacts on other, other species. Um, I would only use them if the the mosquito problems really are 
more than you can contend with with just personal protection you know putting on some mosquito spray because you know nobody likes mosquitoes but they're part of our natural environment and they're a really important food source for a lot of wildlife um so you know we don't tend to try to kill or control mosquitoes just because it seems like the thing to do um it's you know I, i'd reserve that that treatment for um, situations that are particularly bad and those those tend to be those unbalanced um, situations where you don't have um, predators. Um, but I, I think it it can be done. You know, if you were to have an area closer to the house, um, it would you know you could successfully curtail some of the mosquito issues. But you're also affecting the food chain of the vernal pool itself. Right. Um, I'm kind of going to insert in my own question here because I get this sometimes with landowners. You know, knowing that some of our, or quite a few of our amphibians don't necessarily have large dispersal rates, is there ever an issue where you have to worry about, you know, I want to create a vernal pool here, but if there aren't other areas where amphibians are already existing, do you run that risk of, you may never get amphibians in this area if they can't get mm -hmm. there, you know, so kind of taking in that landscape approach, looking for roads that may, or other things that may provide barriers? Yeah, it's a good question. Um in my experience, nature has always surprised me at how things do find their way in. Um, but it, it's a consideration. You know, you you want to set the stage for success. And so you want to have an idea of um, travel corridors and, um, you know, uh, how, how critters may find their way to you. Um, but, um, you know, if, if there's regional populations, and I, I'm hardly the um, expert on on this in terms of how far things will travel, but um, if if there are some available travel corridors, um, you know, within a few miles, things may well find their way into your pool, mm -hmm. and um, you you can consider you know kind of a um, patriation effort, you know, trying to um, pull some egg masses or something from a neighbor's pool or something and, and put them in yours to see if you can establish a population. Great, thanks. Um, Katrina asks, what states have vernal pools other than California and Ohio and what makes these areas survive through conversions? A lot of states um, have vernal pools and, and California actually uses the term differently um, their, their vernal pools, uh, by California standards, vernal pools are uh, seasonal, but they're not forested. And, and in Ohio, we tend to consider vernal pools to be forested systems. And that's true of most states, but um, all across the Midwest and up, up into the Northeast and you know down along the Appalachian Mountains and everything, vernal pools are um, all throughout those, those regions. Um, so there's lots of lots of uh, vernal pools, and in the desert southwest, we have sort of a vernal pool equivalent with the Playa Lakes and things like that that are intermittently um, flooded. Um, but uh, we're we're hardly the only state with vernal pools. Um, as far as the the surviving conversion, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, I think that if um, if vernal pools are already in existence, the um, modifications around those um, uh, locations with the forested areas, um, if if they haven't if they haven't already resulted in a, a demise of the hydrology for the vernal pool, they'll probably persist. Um, if there's new work going on um, next to a um, forest block that has some vernal pools in it and there's new drainage being put in, that would be something to monitor because the, the drainage at the edge of the woods might actually affect the hydrology within the woods over time. Um, and so the ongoing conversion could adversely affect our remaining vernal pools if we're not careful. Uh, Jane's asking, are there any programs that provide funding to build vernal pools, um, like ODNR, NRCS? There, uh, Division of Wildlife has um, private lands 
type program, I think, that can provide some funding for, for habitat. And I think they consider vernal pools. I know that um, the NRCS has some funding that um, is available for agricultural producers um, that uh, can be used for vernal pools. It's not specific to vernal pools, it's more wetland restoration, um, but vernal pools are in the in the mix of, of uh, habitats that they would consider funding. Um, for bigger projects, the H2 Ohio funding source might be applicable. Um, but with with that funding source, the, the major thrust is improving water quality and sequestering nutrients. And oftentimes vernal pools aren't in that ideal environmental setting to accomplish that particular task. So it might be a bit of a, a hard sell. But if you had a really large expanse of a vernal pool that maybe is um, intercepting um, runoff from agricultural areas and might have the potential to remove sediment and uh, nutrients, there's a possibility. Great. Yeah, I know there's there's funding available under EQIP. And then there's also the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for um, Fish and Wildlife. Um, I saw that Donnie Knight was on, so he's one of the folks in the state that helps folks with that. So I put that link in the chat box as well. But yes, there's definitely uh, funding available. And then Mark just said, NRCS programs do allow for vernal pool in all ag type settings, including woodlands. So thanks, Mark, for that. Okay. Uh, Frank is asking, in an upland oak hickory forest, if a large tree falls, the root ball leaves a large hole. Can this mm -hmm. function as a vernal pool? If um, if you're seeing the the hydrology establish, we've seen lots of examples in um, forested kind of wet woods situations where the upheaval of a root mass creates that additional depth that's necessary um, for um, a hydro period that's conducive to breeding of amphibians and frogs. Um, We've actually seen a number of these at the Coyote Run um, site. He has uh, within the the wet woods. There's a number of areas where the the most functional portion of the the vernal pool is in the holes that have opened up when a tree root system has lifted out of the ground. So they can be very productive um, areas where there's a little greater depth and therefore a little um, more sustained hydrology later into the season that allow amphibians to reproduce before the system goes dry. Great. Um, there's a question on, is there a listing of vernal pools by county would be helpful that the public okay. can visit, salamander run alerts. And then I wonder at the same time, if you could speak about how to safely handle some of our amphibians if these folks were to go out on some of these mm -hmm. programs and go out on their own to explore. Sure, sure. Um, so I don't know of any uh, directory per se. Um, Mick Mickishan, who um, is a former EPA employee and um, serves on the board of the Wetlands Association with me, when he was at Ohio EPA, put together a um, uh, a, a GIS resource that identified areas that would be suitable for vernal pool creation. And I, I think that within that resource, you can probably see where um, existing vernal pools are at least suspected based on um, different environmental variables. Um, but at, at this point, um, the probably the best resource we have is a national wetland inventory. And the wetland inventory uses a classification system that doesn't specifically identify vernal pools. They're just forested wetlands, but there's also a um, aspect of the coding that gets assigned that would identify um, forested wetlands that have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, intermittently exposed substrate. And so you could kind of read into that, that, well, it's forested, it's wetland, and it has an intermittent hydrology. So this is probably a vernal pool here, but it's not called out specifically as a vernal pool. Um, regarding, um, you know, vernal pool exploration, it's important that um, you be mindful of your 
your footwear and any equipment that you're using um, and uh, uh, try to sanitize um, your, your boots and equipment when you're moving from one environment to the next um, because there are some um, nasty amphibian diseases like the chytrid fungus that can get spread around and cause problems um, in these pools. So um, we, we tend to sterilize our equipment um, between you know, each pool and you can do this um, pretty simply um, with uh, just a Clorox bleach solution, just kind of scrub down your boots, remove any extraneous mud, um, you know, spray your, your nets and whatever you're taking in to, to sweep through the pool to make sure that um, they're sanitized uh, before you move on to the next location. And then when you're actually handling the amphibians, um, you know, make sure that your, your hands are wet um, and uh, you're handling the uh, biota with care. Great. How, how long do salamanders live on average? Hmm. Um, taking a bit of a educated guess here um, because I'm hardly the expert in that. Um, but I, I think like seven to nine years maybe is a reasonable estimate. Um, and there may be some uh, differences between species, but they don't tend to be very long lived animals, but they certainly persist for multiple years. I believe in captivity, they can get, they can live quite long, but it's different when you're out in the yeah. real world. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the time folks. So if I skip your question, I apologize. I'm trying to consolidate some of them because I know we're not going to get through all of them. Um, do fairy shrimp survive if the vernal pool completely dries up? Yes, um, the 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 adults probably would not survive that unless it were maybe a temporary situation where um, the the pool went dry. The adults are maybe kind of uh, burrowed down in some moist leaves or something, and then the pool you get, you get a late rain or something, the pool fills up again, and the adults might survive that. Um, but what tends to keep the populations going are these dormant um, uh, cysts that reside in the sediment. And their whole life cycle is adapted to this intermittent drying and those cysts can um, survive year to year during months of no water um, and then hatch again for the next um, cycle to uh, the next generation to begin. Um, we have a, a, an added comment uh, by Jenna Roller Knapp. Just wanted to add to make sure to rinse the equipment after you use the Clorox uh, disinfectant. So yes, thank Just you. Rinse Jenna, it with clean that. water. Yeah. Thank and you, then, Jenna. <laughs> and then Rose put in the chat box uh, some information on the Ohio EPA program um, that offers funding for stream and wetland, including vernal pools protection and restoration. So make sure you're checking your chat box, folks. Uh, okay. Um, so another kind of question about gathering eggs. Um, is there a specific way or a program to do that safely and introduce them into quality vernal pools that, you know, where you're not finding those populations of salamanders um, or frogs? Yeah. Um, we, we haven't really done a lot of that. Um, I believe we um, kind of explored the possibility on a project. And um, my recollection is that it's it's not a highly regulated process, um, but it's probably a good idea to talk to the Division of Wildlife to make sure you're on solid footing if you're going to attempt something like that. Um, but um, generally, uh, where I've seen this done, I think that the, the tendency is to move um, egg masses into a new pool so that the as, as those animals metamorphose and mature and, and move into the surrounding environment, they've actually hatched out of that pool and they're um, going to return to that pool as adults to breed if the um, repatriation effort is successful. Um, but uh, that's, uh, I think, from a methodology standpoint, the way to go is to, to try to just pull 
um, a limited number of eggs from another pool and get them situated in a proper location within the pool to let them complete their development and then uh, mature in that new environment. Um, I'm sure there's a bit of trial and error with that. It's, you know, there are a lot of different variables that can affect the health of the animals, the development of the eggs, um, but it has been done. There have been some um, repatriation efforts that have been successful around Columbus even. Yeah, and uh, there's a comment about being aware that some permits may be necessary to collect vertebrates from the wild. So yes. um, folks, just make sure to check your resources, reach out to the um, Department of Natural Resources before you go out and collect anything, just to make sure that you are um, doing the right thing. Always a good idea. Yeah. So um, there is one question that came in about citizen science projects for fourth or sixth graders. So maybe could you talk a little bit about any youth programming that you've done or uh, and or um, tools and equipment that might be useful for those types of programs? There's another question about, you know, different viewers and funnel traps, just given your experience, anything you might recommend. Okay. Um, so in terms of, of programs, um, there we've, we've done some educational programs in our hometown here at Westerville, um, not specific to vernal pools, but, but wetlands. We do a Frog Friday program for the Parks Department, which is a lot of fun for kids to come out and explore the wetland environment with us. Um, the um, First thing that comes to mind, we've had speakers, I think they're joining us again this year um, from a program called Frog Watch, um, which is a citizen science effort. And uh, they're coming to Vernal Palooza to do a presentation. Um, and that would be a great program for, um, you know, the younger set to get involved with. They, they uh, you know, get audio recordings of the different frog species so that they can learn and kind of match them up with what they're hearing and they can go out and monitor um, sites to document the the frogs that are that are calling. Um, so that would be a great thing um, in terms of uh, citizen science for for children to get them interested. Um, those are the first few things that, that come to mind. Um, and I'm sure you know, you may know of other other programs that that you would want to share, Marnie and Kathy. But I think I think that's I think what you mentioned is is probably great. Um, and just in the interest of time, we'll we'll move on. But if folks sure. have more questions, so yeah, no, I think um, that's that's a great. And then yeah. the question of equipment. You know, the equipment is pretty oh, right, simple. Right. Um, uh, you know, a basic minnow trap would you know kind of function as a as a um, funnel trap that could be used. Um, we found some sources for the funnel traps that um, are fairly inexpensive. I'd have to dig into um, who we ordered from, but you might get a, a nice mesh um, funnel trap with kind of a wire frame that helps it hold its shape um, for less than 10 bucks. And um, if you're sampling, you'd probably want to have at least a few of those set out around a, a vernal pool for sampling. Um, but that and um, you know just basic um, aquatic dip nets are really all you need. Um, it's nice if if you have a uh, you know some some glass um, or or plastic um, viewing containers. Plastic's probably better, just so you don't have any mishaps at the edge of the pool. Um, but it's it's nice to be able to observe and uh, take photographs when you're mm -hmm. when you're doing exploring. Um, to have some kind of a clear container that you can put things into. Yeah, that's I found that to be the most useful, whether it's like the little critter things that you can, little containers or just like a large flat tray of some some type. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a question from Mac. I was on a site with inland wetlands and the soil scientist referred to a wet area that resulted from a test pit excavation. How long before this wet depression can be classified as a vernal pool and protected? Interesting question. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers um, tends to um, view any wetland that has formed on the landscape and has been allowed to persist for five years to at that five year mark become a regulated feature. And 
as far as I know, Ohio EPA largely follows suit. So if you do something that creates um, a wetland habitat um, unintentionally, perhaps, um, and you don't reverse that situation to improve the drainage or, or refill the hole or whatever, after five years of allowing it to persist, if it then meets the criteria for uh, a wetland, being that it has wetland hydrology, soils, and vegetation, then it becomes a, a regulated feature. Um, and if it happens that that wetland has vernal pool function, then it would be, you know, a protected wetland that happens to be a vernal pool. But um, that's my thought. Okay. Uh, can a vernal pool be located next to a pond? Um, Krista is saying, I think there, there is what could be a vernal pool within a few hundred feet of a pond in Dublin, or would that, or would something that close just be an extension of the pond? That's a good question. It's um, somewhat unlikely that um, if it's if it's very close to the pond or if it has a physical connection um, to the water surface, um, that it's uh, actually providing vernal pool function. It might not actually go dry. Um, I would have to know a little bit more about the particular site, um, but generally, if we're just talking about a, a pond that um, has a higher seasonal um, water surface that retracts into a smaller footprint and dries out an edge, we wouldn't necessarily consider that a vernal pool because it's a perennial water source that's just a little lower in the late season. Carol's Not asking. Safe frogs wouldn't use it. Yeah. Carol's asking, um, we have a leaky pond and a swamp area develops below the pond dam into a cattail meadow area. If we want to expand the vernal pool below the pond by digging, how deep and how large should it be to be helpful to amphibians? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as I mentioned, um, vernal pools don't have to be very large to provide function. Um, they they just need to have you know some standing water um, during the spring months and it sounds like if you have cattail you might already have a, a decent amount of water there um, but if you're only really seeing inches of um, inundation and maybe a saturated condition that's growing those cattail you could certainly come in and do some excavation to create a little more depth um, so that in the spring there's some swimmable water and amphibians and frogs could could get into that habitat um, and utilize it. So it'd just be a matter of kind of shaping that out and maybe adding another foot of depth. Um, you, you might need to um, manually control cattail for a while because un until you get below two or three feet, um, the cattail will come right back in. But if you're excavating anyway, oftentimes you can remove a good portion of the rhizomes and set that material aside, just land, apply it, spread it someplace else. Um, and uh, at least you kind of reset the system so that you don't have the, the cattail. Um, sorry, I'm going through all of these questions and I had one in my mind and I just, I just lost it. Um, okay, I have it, I got it back. You talked a lot about site prep and construction, which is fabulous. Can you give us a little bit of information on how to manage a vernal pool that always already exists, some things that folks can do to make sure that it's remaining a good habitat? Yeah, yeah I, I know I didn't really build much of that um, into the presentation. Um, I think that the, um, the biggest thing that comes to mind is um, just making sure that the surrounding environment is um, protected and healthy, um, maintaining some forest cover, um, you know, trying to keep the, the buffers as wide as you can of existing, um, you know, intact forested habitat, and then um, controlling invasive species like the Amer honeysuckle and things that will grow um, around the edges that just tend to um, deteriorate the habitat over time. Um, if you can get honeysuckle out and replace it with, um, you know, things like spice bush and um, other native understory species, that's 
uh, far preferable and it's a healthier situation for the entire system. You're not doing work directly in the pool, but the, as I mentioned, the buffers are just so important. And so I would manage the buffers. Um, the other thing that you, you could do um, just in terms of enhancing the overall ecological function of a pool is to, um, you know, kind of assess what you have in terms of um, woody structure within the pool and, and maybe add uh, more um, down logs and things because even though it looks kind of messy to us, it's um, perfect for a lot of the biota that use the pools. Um, they need that substrate. Um, it gives them a lot of protection and, and uh, uh, surfaces to lay eggs on and that sort of thing. Um, with regard to logging best management practices and avoiding any disturbances too close to a vernal pool, what is considered too deep a depression slash rut for migrating salamanders to successfully cross on their way to a vernal pool? Hmm. I, I can't really imagine um, too many issues for, for salamanders getting you know, past um, those ruts, they're they're pretty good at scrambling over things. Um, they'll they'll figure out a way um, to to get to that pool when they're ready to to breed. Um, so I, you know, I don't think there's there's much of an issue there. Um, I think that they'll I, the the one the one um, caution I think would be if the if the rutting is severe and there's a substantial amount of water. Um, you could potentially get um, some of the amphibians breeding in those ruts um, that could actually serve as a, a ecological trap, basically, um, if they dry out more quickly than the pool. And you will see animals reproducing in um, situations where there's not quite enough water depth to get them through um, the, the developmental process to where they can you know, they can climb out of the pool and, and into their adjacent terrestrial habitat. So I've come upon um, areas that have dried prematurely and you'll find, you know, uh, tadpole jerky laying on the surface. Things will just dry out and yeah. you find these flat little poor um, <clears throat> larvae or, or tadpoles that uh, didn't quite make it before the pool went dry. And so um, with, with ruts, um, that would be my biggest concern is that they might entice some organisms. We don't tend to see salamanders laying their eggs in ruts, but frogs definitely will, um, that, that it could be, you know, deleterious to the population just because a certain percentage of the animals are going to breed in a spot where they're not going to be successful in, in actually um, reproducing that next generation. The other part of it from the forester here, Mark, is don't make the ruts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In the first place. <laughs> uh, one little comment, and then we're unfortunately going to have to, to cut it off here so Kathy can put that continuing education link up. Um, but Donnie Knight said, great presentation, Mark, more of a comment suggestion here. If folks are going to take on an excavation on their own, they should make a call to the call before you dig 811 mm -hmm. to ensure your planned excavation will not impact a buried utility. So yes, great addition. Thanks yep. for that. Um, Donnie, sorry, folks, that we didn't get through all the questions. Kathy, I don't think we've ever had this many. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. <laughs> we've I was ended. Oh, usually uh, so I scroll is... through and try to help you, but there weren't any I could help you with. So I... yeah, <laughs> yes, so, so much, many great questions. Um, folks, I will make sure that all of the resources that Mark shared um, are at your uh, fingertips. Like I said, I'll try to post them on our website with the recording of the presentation. Um, Mark, there were requests for some um, copies of your PowerPoint slides, just the PDF. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, we can talk later if you wanna make those available sure. for groups, but obviously great presentation. Everybody was very engaged, hence all the questions. We're gonna have to have you back <laughs> and have a longer Q and A <laughs> question period. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Sorry, didn't, the videos didn't quite pan out, but uh, oh, it was no, it was just really one that didn't, and yeah. um, that was fine. So uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you again so much, Mark, and Kathy's going to put that 